Hello, everyone. Good evening, good morning, depending on where you're joining us. Welcome to A New Year for Change, or E4C for short. Welcome to today's E4C Fellowship Virtual Information Session. My name is Marilyn Lean Clover. I am Program Coordinator at E4C and at the EDD Department at ASME. I am joined today by some of my uh, E4C Fellowship Program Management Team, Carolina Rojas, Erin Pfeiffer, and Jonathan Kemp. And uh, we're also joined by uh, some of our fellow alumni, uh, Miracle Ndego, Nishant Agarwal, and Sahar Shamsi. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, today's uh, info session will be recorded and archived at E4C site and on our YouTube channel, uh, both on the URLs listed on our slide. And with this info session you are participating in today, you will learn more about the Engineer for Change Fellowship, how to apply, hear about experiences and tips from our past fellows, and also have the opportunity to ask questions. And uh, before we go our, to our main topic, uh, we just want to invite you to our upcoming webinar on March 4th, related to uh, in celebration of World Engineering for Sustainable Development Day. So please uh, join and uh, register at our in our webinars page listed here on the screen to uh, listen to our webinar on engineering a circular economy in the built environment. Now, before uh, let's take a moment to meet our audience. So please use the chat window, uh, which is located at the bottom of the screen, and type in where you are joining us from. Okay, Brooklyn, Columbia, Oregon, United States, Virginia, Philadelphia, India, welcome. Welcome everybody. Toronto, Ghana, Malawi, welcome very, welcome to everybody. And just uh, a few tips. Uh, during this info session, please use the Q&A window located below the chat to type in your questions for uh, our program management team for the fellowship and also for our uh, fellow alumni invitees for today. If you don't see it, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides. Uh, we will gather these questions to ask afterwards when we have our Q&A section after we have some presentations. And uh, now I will pass it over to Carolina Rojas to tell us a little bit more about uh, the fellowship program and how to apply. Thank you, Marilyn. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so welcome everyone. Before we talk about the fellowship program, let me talk a little bit about E4C. In Year for Change is an organization that was founded by three leading union organizations, ASME, IEEE, and EWB USA chapter. And it was founded out of the necessity to create bridges between the engineering and international development professions. Since then, Engineering for Change has become an uh, organization that uh, allows uh, people to connect to a global community of one million engineers, technologies, and development practitioners, learn about latest developments, best practices, opportunities, and expert perspectives, explore a growing database of 1,000 essential technologies through our solution library platform, access research studies, multidisciplinary networks, and build insights. And finally, contribute uh, your expertise, increase, and ideas. We at E4C are committed to the sustainable development goals. And a leading question for us is what is what do we need to reach the SDGs by 2030? At E4C, we recognize that there's a need for collaboratively interdisciplinary research and action, prepared technical workforce everywhere, comprehensive systems understanding, and closing the gaps on information silos and democratizing knowledge. So E4C is on a mission to prepare, educate, and activate the international engineering workforce to improve the quality of life of hundreds of communities around the world 
And B, we do this by providing programs, resources, and platforms that accelerate the development of impactful solutions and ensure public health and safety around the world. Uh, our flagship program is the fellowship program, the reason why all of us are here in this session. Um, and this uh, program has been going since 2015. And since then, we've, um, we've had 147 fellows. We are very proud that around 50% of them have been women and we've reached 47 nationalities. Uh, right now, our applications are open until February 14th, as Marilyn mentioned, and our program is a completely digital program since its inception. So this uh, fellowship program is a distinctive workforce development program focused mainly on social innovation and it seems it was uh, to activate and empower early career engineers around the world to solve local and global challenges. And we do this by providing a unique platform to develop skills, connect with mentors and peers. Uh, we offer leadership development opportunities um, that for them uh, to reach their fullest potential as so that they can deliver solutions to achieve the sustainable development program. Uh, goal, sir. Um, our value proposition on the fellowship program is that we match the workers uh, with impactful and meaningful um, work. So we aim to answer critical research questions. So we each year uh, do targeted impact projects aligned to the needs of our partners. And we connect this uh, critical research program with diverse and exceptional technical talent uh, to uh, provide unique insights and essential human infrastructure, uniting the multidisciplinary and visionary individuals and partners to deliver the ecosystem perspective needed to advance sustainable development. Um, we answer these critical questions at the moment through three main types of uh, projects. Um, one of them uh, is impact research and through impact research we investigate research questions at the intersection of engineering sustainability and, the, and global development uh, the second type of pro projects we have is our design for good and these are projects where we assist the product design development and implementation and finally our third type of project we offer our advancing workflows which aims to improve organization systems workflows processes to achieve impact goals more efficiently. So let me tell you a, a little bit of a, a use case for each of these. Um, example of impact research is a uh, research that we did on water energy food innovations in the Middle East. Uh, the fellow conducted landscape analysis and interview-based study, which resulted in a comprehensive report of opportunities and challenge in the region. And it was in collaboration with the American University of Beirut. An example of a design for good project we carried out so far is a project on an aerial release of seeds to support ecosystem restoration. Uh, through this project, the fellow developed a mechanical release system for seeds, which fed into a high level plan to implement drones for the restoration of different mangrove species. And this was in collaboration with uh, We Robotics. And an example for advancing workflows is the uh, case of automating structural retrofits for low-income households in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, through this project, the fellow integrated building information modeling capabilities into the organization's workflow for retrofitting projects to improve earthquakes resilience in Colombia. And this was in collaboration with uh, Build Change. So what does being an E4C fellow offer? Uh, so there are different things. One is that it, it connects the fellows to a global network of experts and like-minded technical professionals. Uh, we um, promote exclusive participation in E4C sponsored events and learning opportunities. Fellows gain practical insight and experiences to become a change maker and leader. They advance knowledge of sector through uh, weekly synchronous learning modules and fellows receive a stipend rating ranging from 1.5k to 5k depending on the cost of living country of residence and level of expertise of the fellow 
who are we looking for for our program? So at E4C, we recognize that the industry is seeking technical talent that can work effectively across cultural, ethnic, and national boundaries to succeed in an increasingly interconnected world. And also that currently we have complex global challenges that require multidisciplinary engineers equipped to work effectively across sectors to create and implement holistic sustainable solutions. So before engineers or in scientists, architects needed a, a set of skills to be a professional, but now uh, the industry is needing this army type um, swift knife uh, where you are required to have uh, knowledge from different sectors and holistic views to um, achieve sustainable uh, development challenges. So for our program, our program has a, a set of requirements. Uh, one of the main requirements that we have is that uh, applicants need to have a senior undergraduate, graduate and post or postgraduate. And we uh, require them to have a focus their interest in global development. Um, it is desired that fellow, the applicants have field experience with implementation, design, or research of technology for social impact, and that uh, applicants have a demonstrated ability to work with diverse international teams. Since we uh, it's completely remote, remote, and we are an international team ourselves. Um, other program requirements are that um, fellows are expected to have excellent project management skills, including the ability to work remotely with minimal supervision. Um, we look for proven ability to research and rapidly acquire knowledge and to communicate effectively and execute good judgment. Um, capability to be resourceful and meet deadlines and also excellent writing skills in English since our whole program is in English. And finally, uh, since our program is virtual, fellows are required to have good internet connectivity throughout the five months of the fellowship, and that fellows are available to attend the kickoff sessions that include synchronous video conferencing that will be scheduled by the first weeks of May. How to apply? Uh, I'll tell you what the process is to apply uh, the first thing you need to do uh, is to be part of our application round one, which is the one we are at this moment. It, it's going to be extended on to February 14th. Uh, for this, we advise you to first review the, our 2022 impact project descriptions um, in the link that uh, will be posted in the chat. And um, once you review the projects we currently have, you can submit your application by filling out the uh, type form. Um, where you'll be requested to indicate your top three project choices. You'll be requested to upload your CV or resume and uh, one uh, to two page later of interest. Um, since many of our projects are funded by Autodesk Foundation and will require Autodesk technology expertise, you will have to indicate your levels of Autodesk technology expertise for different Autodesk products. So this is our application round one. Our application round two uh, will, ha will happen uh, around uh, the end of February, where selected candidates will be notified via email to submit additional information to advance in the recruitment process. So further, further information requested may include reference letters uh, submitted through a reference form and optional reference letters. Um, you have to submit a 200 word writing sample and as applicable evidence of software proficiency. This may be a design portfolios, project models, simulations, etc. Uh, as applicable, uh, we will also requ uh, request evidence of research proficiency, like papers, projects, reports. Um, after this, uh, we'll commence our interview round. So if you are selected to progress to the final round, this will involve online interviews with the E4C program management team. And um, the selection and onboarding for the summer cohort will occur by the end of April of 2022. And to finish, I just want to give a, a few tips 
um, for the application round one, be ready to submit your top three preferred projects and have your covering letter and CV ready to share with us. Make sure your top three choices align with your technical expertise, expertise career goals, and interests. Um, to increase your chances of being selected by, uh, you can indicate you are interested in being considered for projects outside your top three. If you are selected for the summer cohort, you can choose to also be considered for the winter cohort, which is happening from November 2022 to March 2023. Uh, so this is what I had to share. I just want to open up a space uh, for questions uh, and answers. I don't know, Marilyn, if there are any questions. For everybody, um, we have a section of Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Uh, please, if you have any questions, um, you're welcome to post them there. I think we can pass Caro to our uh, alumni fellows, and then at the end, we can tackle, I think, questions for everybody. Great. Thank you, Marilyn. So if there are no any, any questions, let's move on. Uh, um, today, we're joined by an exceptional uh, panelist, uh, past fellow alumni. Uh, thank you, Miracle Sahari Mishan, for being here. Uh, they'll, they'll be sharing a little bit about their experience as a fellow and also about their backgrounds. Um, as our first panelist, we have Miracle Indego. She is currently District Programs Assistant at CAMFED in Ghana, and she's based in Ghana. She was an EPRC Fellow in 2021, and she is a MasterCard Foundation Scholar at Camp in Ghana. She obtained a Bachelor's in Biomedical Engineering from the University of Ghana in 2020. She worked as a tech, teaching and research assistant in the same institution, and she's currently on the MasterCard Foundation Graduate Internship Program at Camp in Ghana, where she assists in implementing the Foundation's Young Africa Works Program in equipping young women secured dignified and fulfilling work. And as a 2021 APRC Fellow, Miracle Research Better Practices for Medical Device Procurement in Africa, with emphasis on the total cost of obtaining these devices. And a full report of her work can be found on the APRC website. Uh, over to you, Miracle. Thank you so much. Um, I'm glad to be here. And my name is Miracle, and I'll be sharing a bit about my journey. So in 2019, as an undergraduate student, I interned the Global Health Design Initiative Program. And it was all about socially engaged design for hard to reach areas. And that was how I fell in love with engineering for global development. And I did the same project as my undergraduate thesis. And in 2020, I worked um, at the University of Ghana as a teaching assistant. So in Ghana, we have this one-year mandatory national service program that every graduate will have to go through. And during that period, I applied for the EFC fellowship and I was glad to be part of it. And currently, I'm working with Mastercard Foundation in Ghana with Hamfed Ghana. Yeah. And I'll be sharing a bit about my project and what I did during EFC. So I worked on improving medical device procurement in Africa. So I developed a decision-making tool for um, total cost of ownership for um, those who want to procure medical devices in Africa. So this project was very important because over 70, over 40% of medical equipment are, that are being procured from outside Ghana or Africa are not fit for the use of which they were procured because of indiscriminate procurement practices. And so it was important to develop a tool that will help them understand the total cost of um, procuring medical device before they actually go in for them. And so my research focus on mainly developing an assessment tool to guide them in making procurement decisions in the area of the total cost of ownership. And I'll also share a bit about my takeaways from the fellowship, what I learned from the fellowship. And so during the fellowship, I'll say, it's a community of engineers who are very passionate about making change and they bring all their expertise to doing something to solve problems that are around us. And in this community, I found myself, I was motivated to even do more. And 
during the fellowship, you would have that, I had that uncommon access to international stakeholders during my research because IFRC is widely connected. So I had the opportunity to interview um, global stakeholders relating to the projects that I did. And also I was exposed to a lot of technologies through the Engineering for Chain Solutions Library. So it's a catalog of um, various technologies in um, either healthcare, agriculture, energy and other sectors. But I worked mainly on the health sector. So I was introduced to various mind blowing technologies that are solving problems in, in how to reach areas. And also during the fellowship, um, every fellow gets to be supervised by an expert fellow, a previous fellow. So because of that um, expertise and mentorship, there was no stress in carrying out the project. And I would say it's a good mentorship program. I mean, the little advice I would say is that you should study applications on time. And we just have a few more days before the end of the application round. Start A and make recommend, ask for recommendation letters on time. And also do not hesitate to write on anything that, that you've done in the past relating to the projects that are uh, going to be carried out this year. And also, don't be afraid to apply. Just put in your application. You don't know. Maybe you are the person they are looking for, and maybe you are scared to put in your application. So just put it in. And if you are the right fit for the program, you'll be picked for it. And this is the time to ask any questions if you have any doubts about the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miracle, for sharing. Um, as a second uh, panelist uh, for today, we have Sahar uh, Shamsi, she's currently program coordinator at Climate Ventures. She's based in Toronto, Canada. She was also at IFRC Fellow 2021 during the summer, but she is currently also a fellow during our winter program. She's a, a Sahar graduated from the University of Toronto with a degree in mechanical engineering. She joined IFRC as a fellow in 2021 and is currently a fellow in the winter 2021 cohort. Uh, her project is for a division of the United States uh, Department of Energy known as the National Renewable Energy Laboratory or NRO. And her going project supports entrepreneurs creating great power desalination systems for disaster relief scenarios. As entries to NRO's $3.3 million waves to water prize competition. Sahar is currently is also currently the program coordinator for Climate Ventures at the Center for Social Innovation, coordinating six accelerator programs serving clean tech entrepreneurs and around all 15 provinces and territories of Canada. So over to you, Sahar. Thank you so much, Carolina. Um, wonderful introduction. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit, just like Miracle, about my journey. And uh, I'll preface it by saying a lot of my journey was impacted or um, accelerated by my time at E4C and at, um, through the fellowship, frankly. So I started at the University of Toronto, my undergraduate degree is in mechanical engineering. And my first project in global development was um, a rainwater harvesting system that I designed for Hands Across the Nation, um, an NGO in Mali. And then I joined the E4C fellowship in summer of 2021. And I worked for the United States Department of Energy's division of NREL, so the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, um, conducting market analysis and engineering support for uh, wave power desalination systems for their $3.3 million uh, waves to water prize. So that's an ongoing project. So it started in summer of 2021, and I'm still working on it in the winter cohort of 2021. Um, advancing Sustainable Development Goals number six and seven, so for clean energy and um, clean water. So also part of, while at my time at uh, E4C as, as a fellow, I was able to join ASME's iShow, um, which is an accelerator for hardware-led social innovation. So I was able to facilitate a hardware prototyping and validation session, and I worked even further with entrepreneurs. So both through my work um, with NREL and as part of ASME's iShow, which I found very cool. And Frankly, through this journey, through uh, E4C and the fellowship, I was able to learn that I really, really enjoyed working with entrepreneurs, learning about new technologies, and being able to directly talk with them about it. So that led me to join uh, Climate Ventures at the Center for Social Innovation here in Toronto, Canada, 
um, where I lead six programs. Um, they're all distinct accelerator programs serving clean tech entrepreneurs across all 13 provinces and territories of Canada. So to this day, I'm able to work with entrepreneurs learning more about cutting edge technologies, which I find absolutely amazing. And uh, a little bit more about my time with NREL um, that's currently ongoing. So this project addresses a global water issue. So the focus of this project is to create this wave powered desalination system, which allows fresh water to be found in areas that are resource constrained. Um, it has various applications. So these modular um, systems can be used in disaster relief, for example, or in residential communities, coastal communities, places that are water stressed in general. And of course, from a renewable energy source. So these are not energy intensive and they're using wave pow the, the power of waves from the ocean. So it's a renewable energy source, which I thought was very cool. Um, my work with NREL was primarily doing market analyses and understanding uh, competitors and what their features are, what their technical designs look like, and how the entrepreneurs participating in this competition, how, they, how their technical designs um, compare to those that are on the market. Um, we also looked at um, key organizations throughout the world and how they deploy and advance these technologies in order to pilot these technologies effectively. Um, and my advice to fellows and my personal takeaways from this project was that, uh, Carolina, if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. So my personal takeaways from this fellowship was that, um, as Miracle mentioned, you work with a global network of fellows. So I work, for example, for, from a fellow, uh, with a fellow from Sri Lanka, and it was absolutely amazing. You get to cross collaborate um, with people of different backgrounds, different cultures, and you learn so much just from that experience. Also, I learned personally, as I mentioned, that working with entrepreneurs on cutting edge new technology is absolutely amazing. And that's something you might not be able to find in other places. And that might be your niche. You might be able to find something that you enjoy. Um, and more than anything, I learned in, through this program that there's a very diverse and unique set of opportunities that you can use to make impact in this sector. Um, you could be in management roles, design roles. There's a wide variety. and E4C kind of shows you all the different paths you can take, which I think is really important. And I guess my advice would be more general, in general for people at this stage, trying to figure out what to do or to learn more about the sector is be a sponge. So that's more like absorb anything you can absorb, like the sponge absorbs water, everything, learn as much as you can about the sector, do as much as you can, learn from the program management team, learn from your expert fellow through your work always, always, always learn. And that might find, you might find what you like to do just like I did. So that's my advice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sahar, for sharing. And last but not least, our third candidate for today is Mushan Agarwal. He is founder and CEO at Life and Lean. He is based in Delhi, India. He was an E4C fellow in 2019 and then an expert fellow in 2020. Nishan concluded his master's with a specialization in manufacturing sciences at the Indian Institute of Technology, uh, Kampur, in 2018. He has been associated with ASME Union for Change since 2019. During the fellowship, Nishan was a part of the research around engineering response to COVID-19 where the team created a reference list of resources to mitigate negative health outcomes worldwide. He founded Life and Lean in the year 2020 to develop cost-effective myoelectric upper limb prosthesis, considering the socioeconomic sphere of the amputees in the low uh, resource settings. And the startup was uh, one of the top three winners at ASME iShow. So over to you, uh, Nishant, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Carolina. Welcome all to this session. I am Nishant Agarwal. I am based out of India. And as the wonderful introduction it was, I was associated with AS ASME E4C since 2018. And uh, starting with the health sector as a health fellow. And then I got opportunity to work on different projects and uh, editorials like the bamboo one, which I find really fascinating. But yes, we can talk about that during some of the q &As. and uh, after that, I joined E4C as an expert fellow uh, 
working with the one of, uh, few of the e4c uh, uh, communities and uh, and the ideas that they were there then uh, i was also associated and got introduced to a number of programs around sdg one of them was unleash lab for sdg which is a uh, 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 a program which is a 10 days lab uh, where you uh, work with 1000 plus uh, innovators ideate, ideators or engineers designers and whatnot who will be uh, working on a similar solution or an idea to develop and uh, basically uh, curate some some ideas into a workable product or prototype or even uh, uh, a tangible product so that was uh, an experience uh, that I would like to share on Unleash. And then uh, in 2020, I uh, was uh, doing my research and uh, doing a corporate job as well. So I decided to quit my job and start life in them as a part of uh, uh, or extension of my thesis. And that's how uh, I ended up participating in the SMEI show after a year. And luckily, and um, uh, I was uh, amongst the three winners of ASME I Show India, and that's how the journey of uh, Life LM is going on, and I'm still working on validating the product as well as the design. Next slide, please. My research in 2019, since uh, that was the year where we saw a lot of uh, boundaries in terms of uh, uh, moving the resources, supply chain issues, and the response to COVID-19 pandemic, engineers and designers and uh, factory owners, even, even the people who are not associated with manufacturing the PPEs and uh, other rapid testing kits, they were called upon to uh, help in sustaining that era. And uh, I, I guess you all remember that it has been almost three years now that this thing started. And our E4C report was uh, along the lines where we curated a list of resources and standards that have to be that have to be followed in making the PPEs, ventilators, and other medical aids. And that's how uh, the report, uh, which is a live uh, document, which is available on the E4C website, where all the resources are listed on. Next slide, please. We worked on uh, two... Uh, can you go to next slide? Yes. So we worked on two uh, of the uh, main uh, main solution categories where one was on the medical devices and the PP, and other was uh, the testing solutions, the rapid test and the antigen test and other uh, problems in 3D printing, the swabs and the resources that are needed for the testing solution. We came up with a number of case studies where we wanted to observe how uh, the engineers and designers are working together to make these devices available to the masses as well as making them uh, accessible in the, in, in, in the area where, uh, in the areas where there are restrictions on the movement and people have to work remotely. And at the same time, we were also working on uh, identifying the new technologies and new standards that are being made specifically for COVID-19 cases and uh, uh, tackling those uh, uh, and taking the measures against it. Next slide, please. We worked on nine uh, case studies out of uh, 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 out of, of the many that we came across. We interviewed a number of key companies and research projects, and some of them were really interesting. And we saw a lot of collaborations between multinational companies like uh, GE and Ford, where they converted one of their factory units into uh, in, into a facility where they were making ventilators and PPEs and other things. Also. Uh, a lot of uh, case studies were uh, also there on in terms of contact tracing and new solutions like app enabled uh, mapping of uh, of the active cases even uh, the a smart city project in korea as well as the uh, only app that is functional during that time was aragyo setu in india and all all other these uh, case studies were very inspirational and as well as gave a lot of understanding and how standards and other things were defined during that specific period next slide please my personal takeaways from this research and in general other uh, editorials and as well as the projects i have done with e4c it's understanding the standards and other things that follow 
So in, in particular, in this case, uh, I was associated with many of the researchers and it, uh, that this, this project was a part of a, a big, bigger team. We uh, collaborated with a number of organizations and even uh, I guess Carolina was also there in the same uh, project and we were five other fellows were there. And understanding the standards and the new regulatory compliances that were there is uh, interesting and we got to know through this research, this research only. Uh, there were new companies that were forming in, during that period. New startups were erupting on making sure that we get PP kits, we get uh, the, the contact tracing uh, uh, done. We, we also saw a lot of uh, uh, boom on making the ventilators in the country, specifically in India. There are a lot of people who are also doing it right now. And the case studies like GE Ford and Noka Robotics, so, so they collaborated together to make something that they, they are not uh, 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 they are not expertise expert, uh, they, they don't have expertise in so Ford is into automobile but they came together to make the healthcare solution so uh, all these things are very inspirational and these are my personal takeaways from this research particularly the engineering response to COVID-19 for the advice on uh, if uh, on e4c application I would say uh, uh, Find out how your research area can be aligned towards uh, any of the SDGs that you you are you are focusing, or if you don't know about the SDGs, SDGs in general, which I, uh, I I can share that I got to know about the SDGs very later on when I started my research, which was on affordable or cost-effective processes. Uh, so you can start researching about this and align. Uh, what your research areas are on in, in terms of how it can be related to any of the SDGs or sustainable development goals. And that would be really helpful in answering some of the questions during the fellowship application or the interviews. And uh, second is on starting the application as well as uh, uh, from the beginning. So you can also uh, talk about your research areas and also on how uh, the E4C align with your career, as already mentioned by Sar and Miracle. Uh, you you have to align. You you must think about the directions where E4C can help you in your career, as well as your research uh, or maybe your future work prospect. Making a false validation may be not something that uh, E4C would be looking out for. Uh, we as an E4C fellow do a lot of research as well, uh, although it is. Uh, right now, the format is changing, evolving year by year. But uh, in my time, I, we we were very much engaged in this research. We used to talk to a lot of uh, uh, innovators, founders, and uh, engineers. Also, a lot of research goes into uh, reading some of the white papers and uh, attending some of the uh, webinars. We got to learn about how uh, we can uh, put the right thing on, on anything that is published on the E4C website that may be useful for the innovators who is visiting or, uh, or the person who, or the founder who is visiting the solutions library. So make, while making these claims and other things available to the public, we make sure that we do wonderful uh, desk research and also talk to a lot of founders and other, uh, uh, other uh, engineers. So, Maybe uh, you should also think about while applying that it would be uh, uh, it would be interesting if uh, you have a lot of experience and a lot of alignment towards doing the research as well. That that would be my uh, advice from EcoC. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nishant, and thank you everyone uh, for sharing. And just want to open up a little bit uh, the space uh, for a short panel with all of you. Um, I have one main question. It's like, are there any unexpected benefits uh, for being part of the fellowship that you would like to share with the applicants? Maybe we can start uh, with you, Miracle. Okay. Um... So, <laughs> unexpected benefits of the fellowship? Yeah, I would say yes. So for me, um, I developed a lot of skills during this fellowship. I mean, working, um, doing everything online was a skill I developed. 
and I even learned how to work very comfortably with um, Google Sheets um yeah how to even manage the projects that i was working using slack and asana there were a lot of benefits from the projects i didn't see coming so i would say you don't even know what you would expect but even um during the fellowship after like even after the fellowship i even got um, the opportunity to take a certification course with Utodex foundation that was given to us as fellows who requested so yes there are so many unexpected things that you might get even out of the fellowship Thank you, Miracle. Anything you would like to add, Sahari, uh, Michan, from your experience? Yeah, um, I would kind of build upon what Miracle said. And definitely the thing about opportunities, like E4C and ASME is the kind of place where if there's any other opportunities available for you, they'll make sure you get it and that you're able to participate. Or if you want to learn something, they'll support you in learning something new or if they have any resources available they'll send that over they're very supportive in that way so i think that was something that i wasn't expecting um to be getting other opportunities outside like from the fellowship or to learn things that are outside of just the base work or the research project that i was doing which i thought was really cool yeah i got to learn from uh, about asme i show from the fellowship itself so uh, i guess that is also very much beneficial that uh, my startup life and limb got recognized and uh, got validated because a lot of uh, interesting profiles were there who were the jury members who were there the panelists facilitators who saw the idea they believed in the product and the our approach and that's the that's we uh, as a startup founder you look for so asme i show was uh, definitely a turning point and it uh, we we got to introduce uh, to this uh, wonderful idea of uh, or, or, uh, of ISO Innovation Showcase uh, through ASME uh, E4C only. Thank you for, for your answers. I have one last question and then I'll uh, pass it on to you, Jonathan, to answer the question from uh, the attendees. Um, I want to know a little bit more on, on the process that you all followed for your projects, your research project, and if you have any insights in the mistakes that you took or how do you receive feedback along the way and the, the support from the C for your projects. Um, I'll start with you, Nishant, and then I'll go on with the hard work. Yes, uh, on, on the project that I did with the E4C, uh, I'll start with the, the one which was on bamboo thing. Uh, it was uh, we we I got to know about the benefits of bamboo, how sustainable it is, and how, what many products can be made out of it. And we did an editorial on that in 2018. And at the same time, all, all, I, I was also ex, uh, experimenting with my career choices. So I I figured out a way to make bamboo bottles out of that, and how engineering bamboo and other things can be employed to the habitat sector where uh, wood can be or hardwood can be replaced with bamboo wood. So all these things were very fascinating and it was a new chapter to learn about how engineering and engineering and design can be included together to make sustainable solutions. That's one. Uh, second, when we were researching on uh, uh, engineering response to COVID-19, I got to meet a lot of innovators and founders themselves who were making these wonderful solutions on E4C, uh, if, uh, sorry, not E4C, but uh, PPEs and uh, ventilators. So one of the meeting I remember is uh, with the, the Canadian Shield project where they were making PPE uh, kits as well as the shield. And uh, they were just, uh, they, were, they were very excited in sharing their idea and their motivation while they were working in that complete lockdown. And they were talking through the camera from their factory shed, where there were a close knit team of eleven members or so. So this uh, interaction and during the lockdown, when we were also working remotely, is quite uh, overwhelming for us to understand that we are uh, working on some of the projects, and and there are people who are working on COVID nineteen response as well. So these are some of the learnings I did uh, during my research at E4C. Thank you, Nishant. 
Uh, anything you would like to add, uh, Sahar and Mirko? Yeah, so um, you mentioned, Carol, about um, support from the team, uh, from the E4C team, for example. Um, I think there, uh, as I mentioned in my first uh, answer as well, I think the management team is exceptional in what they do. Uh, truly, like every fellow that I've talked to in our cohort feels really supported. Um, like for me personally, uh, my expert fellow was Erin, who's on the panel today, and she was absolutely amazing. Um, we, we together have been through so many interviews with both entrepreneurs and experts in the field, which in and of themselves were very interesting talking to people who've been working in the field for 20, 30, 40 years, and then having that support from, for example, Aaron and our team to be able to effectively um, have those interviews and then get feedback from my expert fellow that, hey, this went well, and this is what we can do to improve. I feel like my skills in that sense have like developed so well because of that. And I'm really thankful to like the management team and to other fellows for helping each other out in that way and having that support. Um, I think that really helps develop your skills. And that's uh, one of the highlights of this fellowship. Yeah, exactly. So from what she just said, like the, the support is amazing. And there were always resources for whatever we wanted to do. If it was research, there was a resource guide that you could check out to see how to go about things. So you don't have to worry. <laughs> There's massive support on this fellowship. Thank you. And we have a, a question from the audience uh, for all of you. Um, so in one sentence, can you speak a bit more on the fundamental soft skills that you learned? Um, someone is asking if you can tell us a bit more about the sense of community. I know you already just touched a little bit of that, uh, but the sense of community involved in being in a cohort of fellows. We talked about the support from the team, but um, what about the community aspect of fellows? Whoever wants to, I, to start, uh, Nishan, would you like to? Uh, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but uh, I guess it is around the uh, how uh, we leverage from the community of E4C and in general? Yeah, um, yeah, the sense of community of being part of the cohort of fellows, yeah. Yes, so uh, I guess uh, uh, during my research and uh, while working on the project reports as well, I found out uh, we were in the groups. So for the fellows uh, who, who want to be fellows of E4C, I, uh, I just want to say that we were divided into groups and we were assigned an expert fellow who will be leading on some of the submissions. And we were working on uh, our product reports and desk research, which is quite interesting. So when we were doing so, we got to learn about different communities. We used to have some uh, informal calls where we uh, discuss about the ideas and hobbies and our research area, our personal career growth, and as well as whatever we are doing in our personal life as, uh, as which can be related to E4C, of course. And uh, that's how we learn about different cultures as well during that journey. And we take help on different subjects. For example, uh, I, I remember Jonathan, while working with Jonathan, I, I know that uh, a lot of uh, organizing is required in terms of uh, managing the solution library assignment, desk research editorial. And uh, he was quite, uh, sorry, I'm so sorry. He was quite uh, uh, good at put at that, and that is something I learned from Jonathan being organized in making sure that every submission is possible in time, although we did uh, missed a few deadlines. And uh, so similar thing happened with other fellows as well, uh, people working in food. Uh, so I remember one of the fellows who are working in, uh, uh, in, in an industry where they were 3D printing food, and this is something I learned from his experience and his journey. So all these experiences and uh, talks and interactions were really wonderful. And this is something which we learned as a part of the E4C Fellowship. Thank you, Nishant. Um, then I'll, I'll pass on the word to Sahar and then Mirko, and that will be my last request for today for you. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, I think the best testament to the sense of community that we have at E4C or um, ASME is kind of us right here. Like the panel is all made of past or present fellows. We all, once you're here, you're kind of very interested in staying here and learning more and working together because it's such a great environment. We all learn so much from each other. Like I can say that personally. Um, and you kind of make friends across continents, across different cities. I think that's really cool. And we kind of lean on each other when we need things or we want to learn more about something, we can ask each other. Or if we want to know how something is on the other side of the world, how things are going or how it pertains to our projects, we have people to lean on. We, you kind of have, your network expands globally. And I don't think you can get that at very many other places. Um, so that's something that's really unique about this fellowship and I think very amazing. Um, that's what I'll say about sense of community here. Thank you, Sahar. And what about you, Mariko? So I'll say even after the fellowship, I can say I have friends all over the world because the, the fellowship is made up of people from everywhere. So during the fellowship, we did things together that fostered that kind of friendship, even um, doing things out of the fellowship, like they say. So they always, always like both of the fellows sometimes share opportunities from wherever they are with us. And maybe you are here in Ghana and there's an opportunity somewhere, you can apply for that opportunity and look for benefits. So it's a great community. Thank you. And thank you again, Nishan, Sahar, and Miracle for being here. We appreciate your constant support. I'll pass on the word now to Jonathan. Uh, he'll be answering some of the questions from the attendees. So over to you, Jonathan. Thank you so much, uh, Carolina, and thank you so much to all of our fellow alumni, uh, Sahar, Miracle, and Ashant for joining us and um, sharing your experiences today as well. Um, I just want to highlight a few of the uh, questions that we've received um, and the responses to them. Uh, I know we've responded um, in a written format in chat uh, or through the Q&A system in Zoom, uh, but for, you, for all of your benefit, I'm going to share some of those answers uh, verbally. Uh, so we received a question asking um, if if you're interested in the winter cohort and not the summer cohort, um, should we still apply using the summer cohort application link? Um, and our response is that uh, we do recommend that you fill out the application form, uh, but uh, you can flag that you are particularly interested in just the winter cohort by putting uh, winter, capital W-I-N-T-E-R, as your referral code and also adding a note at the end of the application um, in the space for questions that you're interested in just the winter cohort. After applications close, there will be an interest form that gets put out uh, for anyone to express their interest. But by applying through the application form now, we'll have more information available about you and so can start to consider you for a potential winter cohort project earlier. Um, one question was about what the total duration for the fellowship program is. Uh, the fellowship program is a five-month program from May up until September of 2022. And the winter cohort runs from November up until March. And so again, it's five months. Um, we thank you for those who've asked questions or who've expressed questions just saying that they've applied and are um, looking forward to uh, being considered. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, those who are concerned about um, expertise in Autodesk software knowledge. Uh, so different projects um, involve different levels of, um, of knowledge in software or other, um, other skills. Uh, a number of our projects uh, this year and um, in the past year have involved a high degree of um, Autodesk software knowledge and that's um, because of a, a sponsorship that we've um, very generously received from the Autodesk Foundation. Uh, which involves us having projects working directly with some of their grantees. And those projects in some cases require Autodesk software knowledge. Uh, we ask that if you, if you don't have the level of skills that have been expressed on the project um, as being required, uh, so for example, if the project requests advanced skills or intermediate skills, uh, we would not advise you to apply for that because uh, in, our, in the application process, we have to consider um, whether whether you have the skills that are required for that project. Uh, there may be some opportunities to gain specific um, skills within a program if you are knowledgeable in that program already. 
um, to the right degree, but just don't know that specific facet of it as part of the program. And we do look to build up your skill set across a whole range of different skills. Um, but um, we, yeah, we recommend that you have um, the required uh, software skill set as requested um, before selecting a project as a preference. Uh, undergraduate students. So if you're not yet in the final year of your studies, or um, also not in, about to enter the final year of your studies in the time following the fellowship, uh, you are still eligible for the program um, as any early career engineer um, or technical professional is eligible. Uh, that would also include people in uh, community colleges. Um, however, we do recommend that um, you, you, you indicate your level of experience correctly and, um, and your, your level of academic studies correctly, um, and that you apply particularly to projects where you have some additional skill that can set you apart or uh, prior experience that can set you apart. Um, as that will help us to, um, to, to, to select you for a, for a suitable project. Um, sorry, um, an additional question. So if you don't formally have a specific required qualification, but you do meet most or all of the other desired or required qualifications, uh, yes, you can still apply for that project, uh, particularly if you don't formally have something but do have um, very equivalent or similar um, skills. So that, that would include being um, expert in a very compatible but different um, Autodesk software or, um, or in the research skill set or data skill set um, that's asked for for specific projects. Um, I'd like to highlight that um, if you have applied already, but um, have found that uh, attending this session or by looking at the, our website, that there's different projects that you'd now be more interested in working on. Uh, we have uh, the opportunity for you to change the pro project preferences that you've expressed in your application. Uh, I'm putting into chat now um, the link in, included with that, uh, with that question response. Um, Okay, apologies, that was the wrong, uh, the wrong link. Um, can one of my colleagues please put the link into chat um, in response to that? But that, that allows you to change your project preferences um, if you've applied already. Um, if a project involves physical hardware, uh, typically that will be handled by the partner organization. Um, and so you may be supporting them with design elements remotely. In some cases, though, they've requested um, in some degree of in-person support, in which case they'll have required that the applicant uh, for that project be based in the same country where they're based. Um, and then uh, you as the fellow would have some measure of in-person contact with the partner support on the physical hardware in addition to the, um, to the remote aspect of the fellowship. Um, for those projects where um, a specific region or country of interest is listed, um, we will consider people globally for, for all positions where a region isn't required, um, but you will be given priority if you're in or from a region or country of interest. Uh, some projects mentioned that they're continuing um, from previous years. So there was a question, is it possible to contact fellows who've worked on these? Uh, all of our past projects, the information about them can be found on the EFC research page um, and the details of who worked on them, um, including uh, links to people's LinkedIn, for example, can be found there. Uh, so you are welcome to contact um, the fellows who have worked on the project in previous years. Uh, however, we do ask, since there's um, a large number of applicants for the program, that you don't um, uh, send too many requests if you're not receiving a response to that fellow, but you instead contact us um, as the fellowship management team and we can get you a, um, a more specific response. Uh, there is no limit to the number of times that a person can be applied to, apply to be part of the fellowship. Uh, you, we should, you should only spit one application for each application cycle as, um, as we can only consider uh, the top three project preferences for you once for um, this cohort, um, but you're able to um, apply in successive years. 
those uh, those who've been part of um, our program already are um, cons considered alumni. Um, and so there's a slightly different route for them applying. But even if you've not been part of the program already, we've had many people who applied once um, and either because their expertise wasn't um, correlated to the projects that were available um, or because of the space available in the fellowship, just weren't able to be selected that year, but then applied again and were able to become a fellow in a successive year. Uh, so we, we really do encourage you to apply um, and just tell us if you've applied before. Um, Finally, we, um, yeah, if you don't make it to the fellowship program, um, are there any volunteering opportunities available? Uh, well, we will encourage you if you don't make it uh, to apply to the winter cohort and also to next year's fellowship. Um, and uh, there will be the opportunity to express your interest in volunteering opportunities that may come up. Uh, however, we don't have any volunteering opportunities currently available. Um, and there are a large number of applicants and so um, unfortunately we even if volunteering opportunities do become available we cannot uh, guarantee um, offering them to any individual applicants uh, thank you so much and let me pass over to Marilyn to close thank you very much for everybody for attending uh, this uh virtual info session. This is all we could manage uh, to accommodate the time we, we had. Thank you so much for all your questions. I hope this has been very useful. And also thank you so much to Sahar, Nishant, and Miracle for joining us and sharing their amazing experiences and tips for everybody who is interested to applying for a fellowship program. Um, we have provided you uh, the links where to apply, information from our brochure, how to change your project preferences, and if you have any questions, please remember to contact us as at fellows at engineeringforchange.org. So uh, thank you very much, and um, we look forward to your applications. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.